Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're looking to have a spirited conversation about the relevancy of the 556 cartridge. This is a cartridge that has been used by the US military since the Vietnam War. There's a whole backstory there. Maybe we'll touch upon some of that in this video, but we have uh, two other folks here in studio with me today, Jason and Pad, and um, they're gonna kind of help carry this conversation. Now, Jason and I pretty much see eye to eye on the conversation we're about to have, but Pad has a different perspective. I also will add that uh, Jason and Pad have combat experience. I do not. So I'm speaking from a civilian standpoint. They will be speaking about perhaps some of the things that they've encountered with the 556 themselves. With all that being said, let's get started with the conversation that the 556 sucks. So the 556 in my opinion, is less than ideal for a mainline infantry cartridge. I think it's it where it shines is lightweight, um, it, low recoil, so your average troop isn't going to be put off by it like the M14, right? They'll be able to control it on full auto. But current U.S. military doctrine is that full auto isn't readily used. It's not Vietnam anymore where you fire 50,000 rounds to get one confirmed kill, where you're just spraying the jungle with lead. Troops are now trained to take aimed fire, right? right. Did you guys agree with that? Yeah, Okay, so with that being said, we, we, um, let's go back to how we wound up with the 556. So at the end of World War II, we learned what the Germans had done with the STG-44. The whole world was like, oh my goodness, this is the path forward for infantry rifles. But because you know, before that, like World War I, we were using long rifles, full-powered cartridges with sights that would increment from anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 meters. And most engagements were happening in trenches that were just a few hundred yards apart. So... There was a shift in World War II to weapons that weren't necessarily set up for long-range shooting. But at the end of World War II, we really learned that most, especially fighting in Europe, that a lot of the combat took place inside of 300 yards. So the whole world wanted to move to an intermediate cartridge. The, there's a whole backstory about this. If you guys haven't, uh, aren't familiar with Small Arms Review, uh, check out their channel. Chris talks about this ad nauseum. It's a really good story to hear about how we screwed over our allies, how we wound up with a 308. Uh, but... The short version is, is we promised our allies that we would adopt the FAL if they adopted our uh, 308, which was just a slightly shortened 30 6 cartridge. At the time, the U.S. military, U.S. brass suffered from not invented here, so there was no way they were going to look at the superior cartridge, which was the 270 Brit. If we would have adopted that, we probably would still be using that 270 Brit today. Okay, backstory. We adopt the M14, get into Vietnam, and the M14 comes up short. Woodstocks. And, and grease on ro rollers and stuff like that. Did the M14 have rollers in it? I think they got rid of that. But anyway, wood stocks that would swell in the jungle and the heat and wet environment, and the 308 was just completely uncontrollable on full auto, so much so that they would just take that functionality of the rifles and issue them as semi-automatics, and they're going up against AKs, right, which would be more in tune with uh, what, what the Germans were using with the STG-44. So U.S. military quickly tried to pivot, to pick up something else. We'd already convinced our NATO allies to adopt the 308. We had the M14. We didn't adopt the foul like they did, but they adopted the 308. And now we're trying to find something that can spray lead quickly, that's lightweight, that can go up against the AK-47 and very much CQB in, in a dense jungle. So that's how we got to the 556, in my opinion. Thoughts? No, I fully agree. I mean, <clears throat> in Vietnam, it was basically just hosing bullets into the jungle. I watched many a documentary on it and some footage. And you just literally watch people hose rounds into the jungle for what, like you said, one confirmed kill. You know, yeah. so that's a, basically that's what they were looking for. You know, in my opinion, they basically wanted something they could just spray lead as fast as possible into their lightweight carry it made of polymer and aluminums and uh, was less resistant to, you know, corrosion and things of that nature. So. I think the M16 was a genius weapon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, right. it, it absolutely, I mean, and the fact that it's remained in military service for 60 years, and now with all these com block, former com block states joining NATO, they're mostly adopting some version of the M16. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Even the Germans gave up the G36, and they're going to a variant of the M16. The French dumped their FAMAS bullpups. They're going to a, the German version of the M16. The Estonians, LMT, you know. It, the Canadians the, the are also on LMT. Canadians, but yeah. they also had their, their own AR-15s that they licensed from Colt that they manufactured. The, and, and New Zealand just adopted the M16. So the M16 is still growing in popularity, and, and the 5.56 persists. I know. Why does the 5.56 still persist? Because I think it comes up short. Now, this is where I'm going to defer to you guys now. I shoot a lot of ammunition. I shoot, you know, 
conservatively 80 to 90,000 rounds a year, right? I mean, we fill up buckets full of brass. Thanks to our friends over at Federal and Norma, by the way, for supplying that ammunition. But do a lot of shooting, right? We've done barrier test penetration. We've done a lot of shooting at distance. And we've done a lot of, you know, gel shooting and stuff. But, um, you know, 5.56, I found, is not the most accurate cartridge inherently. I mean, we've tried every flavor of match ammunition. And at best, at best with anything that's factory made without hand loading, maybe a minute, maybe just under a minute. Mm -hmm. And then there's other cartridges that the U.S. military is looking at currently, like the 6 Arc, which we can consistently get half minute accuracy using match ammunition out of it. So what are your thoughts on the 5.56? Do you guys still think that the 5.56 is the right choice for 2022? Or should we look at, at possibly uh, looking at another new NATO standard, something that not only is good at close range and CQB, still has uh, low recoil, but is also good to at least 500 yards? Because in Afghanistan, we got into wide open spaces. In Iraq, we had a lot of CQB going on in, in an urban environment. And the 5.56 five, is better suited, in my opinion, at close range than it does, is at long range. So I'm going to defer to you guys on what your thoughts are. Let's go first, Pad. Well, um, first of all, my military service, I was not a shooter. I was a builder. I did find myself in combat, but um, I have watched the Marines put the 5.56 five, to good use, those guys in 3.5 and in 2010, very calculated decent range shots to, to good effect. Um, so speaking, speaking as a, as a marksman and a shooter, I, I really can't probably as, as, uh, accurately as somebody who was trained to fill that role in the service. But, um, really and truly, I think it comes down to or at least one reason I think that the round is still so prolific in militaries around the world is that not all branches and not all militaries are a volunteer military you know here in america when you go into the service no matter what branch i think everybody makes no illusions about the fact that at some point they're going to be shooting a gun they're going to be trained on a rifle and that's an acceptable condition for them you get countries like israel or or you know other first and, and third world countries that have you know mandatory military service you're taking everybody you're taking everybody so the you, you're not going to have as much of a volunteer effort to come and shoulder these rifles because everybody's got to do it. So um, here in America, you know, a lot. How many people have you heard say, "Ah, oh, my dad taught me on our on our first 22." Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so there's already some kind of familiarity with a low power cartridge. To me, um, now as a salesperson, making the transition from a 22 cartridge to like a 223 or a 556 five, is not a huge jump for people. It's, you know, a little bit more in the recoil, but it's it's still pretty familiar. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, here where we have a volunteer force going up to a larger caliber might be expected whereas when you're taking in everybody of legal age to bring into a service as mandatory 2 years or 4 years or whatever your mandatory service is, you have to have something that's not going to come as a shock to those who have less experience. So, I think that alone makes it a relevant cartridge because you can literally hand these to anybody and within five minutes you can teach them how to pretty effectively hit a target with an AR using a 223 cartridge. Yeah, it definitely helps reduce like people's flinch response or whatnot yeah. because the recoil really is that light in an AR-15, M16. So that's one thing to, you know, think about. Uh, you hand a, a rifle with heavy recoil, you're going to create that response of that they're going to you know, flinch when trying to shoot this thing and realize, oh, this wasn't that bad, and then things will get better. But <clears throat> as far as that, you know, service goes and this, that, and the other, firearms can always be tuned. I'm the biggest tuning person there is out there, at least in this shop. I can pretty much set up anything. If it's got a proper gas port, you can tune the recoil of a firearm. So you can have a fairly heavy caliber in a gun and have fairly light recoil to go with it if there's some engineering behind it. Gas port size, buffer weights, springs, this, that, and the other. So, five, five, you can almost have a 6.8, a 6 arc, or something like that, have the recoil of a 5.56 five, while still putting forward more energy and best, better ballistics. Um, you were saying that, you know, you watched or encountered, you know, shooting, but you were more of a builder. I have to say that, uh, Marksmanship is definitely one of those things back when I started serving in, what, 03 and deployed in 05. 
they were just digging M14s out of the mothballs and bringing DMRs on the line, right? <laughs> so this was, you know. Because the 556 was falling right. short. We used the M24 as our, our sniper rifle and whatnot, and it was terrible. I mean, it was an awful thing to sit there and tow it around with this bolt-action gun because shots you needed a semi-automatic, henceforth the M110 SAS starting to, you know, develop and come out and this, that, and the other. But it was hilarious because they started bringing in designated marksmen. And that's where they gave us some old M14s with some scopes on them. And they would hand them out. And there'd be like one person per team or squad or whatever it is out there with this M14. So they could get some greater distance for better energy on target or better distance. Because 223556, when we went out to Wyoming on a prairie dog hunt, I actually got so mad because I was like, this is awful. The wind was cooking out there. It was every bit of 25 miles an hour or so, 2025. And that was kind of standard out there. And I actually had to put the, just the gun away. And it was a 16-inch uh, MR uh, 5.56 because I could literally watch through the scope. There'd be a prey dog out there at, you know, a couple hundred yards. And you'd watch the that. round yeah. just sit there and psh, on the dust all over the place. I'm trying to adjust for wind. But once you made that wind adjustment where that round landed, the wind had already changed and swirled. And it would just pull out a 6.5 Creedmoor so you... and literally just... Ah, right there, right, because it fucked that wind just right that it didn't care. It sounds like you were hunting with a combat rifle and coming up short. Yeah, we're shooting at fairly small well, targets. I mean, you know, a prairie dog is is you know we got shorter than a foot cause, tall because two two three five five six was developed from two twenty two, which was a varminting cartridge. Right. right. So two two three five five six was essentially a varminting, a varminting cartridge. cartridge. I mean, that's just the way I kind of look at it. Yes, it is light recoiling and all that good stuff, but it's Great for varmints, but we know it hits a coyote much better. A six arc, <laughs> six yeah. eight. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, coyotes. I mean, you saw what happened to one. I was hitting with a three oh eight. I mean, right. that's, a, that's a tough animal to put down. I would never go coyote hunting with a two twenty three. I mean, there's plenty of coyotes that have died at the hands of two two three. Don't get me wrong. Right. You know, and there's plenty of you know Afghanistan Iraq people that have fallen to five five six. But that goes with my say. If you put holes where holes aren't meant to be, it's gonna die. You know what you know the what most I mean? you, know, you know what the most Deadly cartridge, the most used cartridge in crime in the United States has been historically. Twenty-two long rifle, probably. Precisely. Yeah. So again, it all that's required to end life is to put a hole someplace where it shouldn't be, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people get into these discussions with handguns, like, "Oh, I want you know this rip cartridge in ten millimeter and a bullet going seventeen hundred feet per second with a sixty-five grain projectile." Blah 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 blah. Handguns are just horribly underpowered in general. What matters is learn how to use the weapon and know where to shoot hit center of mass, and that's the only way you're gonna end the fight. Mm -hmm. Rifles change that because you have much more hydrostatic shock, mm -hmm. right? Much more disruption of tissue. But the point still being, putting holes in places, like you said, that they don't belong is what ends the fight. With that being said, I agree that the 556 is light recoiling. We were just out shooting, you know, we have six ARC, we have six SPC, running the Rec 7 uh, in a recent video. And I, I, I rapid fire it, and I rapid fire a 556. And Really, while I could tell there was a little bit more recoil, if you're just watching the video, you're not going to see any difference. The rifle's not jumping all over the place. But then I shoot the HK91, and you can see the recoil. It's pushing me back every single shot. And yes, I can hold on to a G3 on full auto, just lean way into it. But in a fight, that's just way too much recoil. And you're certainly not going to train a troop, a conscript especially, to effectively use that. I mean, the US military ran into that with the M14 and wound up taking the full auto out of it. Many of the 90 nations plus that adopted the FAL took the full auto out of it because it was just impractical. So I get the recoil thing, I get the weight thing, but we're not talking about a massive increase in recoil nor weight if we look at more practical cartridges. Now we do have a couple of customers, one in particular that we have direct communications with who's actively in the SEAL teams currently, and they're using six arc. And what has he told you about it? I haven't had the conversation with him directly. You have. So, I, I mean, I, I just had some here. I haven't had a full conversation with him yet. He's a very busy guy. But, but I just uh, saw him in the store a week or two ago. He, you know, yeah, I think he's on leave or whatnot. You know, so he's visiting family and then he'll be back doing what he's got to do. Um, but, yeah, their, uh, their, their team or whatever it is is using 6ARC, whether it's in short configurations or long configurations, as far as I remember, like yeah. as a breacher role, if you will. Yeah. Did and you there, there, it, it would be, yeah. Oh, Pat, the one to you talk chatted to. with him. Yeah. I thought yeah. Jason no. brought it up, so I thought he was the one. 
You, you chatted with them. Yeah, he was basically the biggest tick in the box for them is that it extends it extends the lethal velocity range of the cartridge. So where you know your your two two three and five five six historically is moving the fastest and most most lethal out to about three hundred to four fifty or so. Um, he was saying that they have maximized that and almost doubled that range where it's still carrying very lethal velocity out to anywhere between six and eight, depending on the configuration of the rifle. Um, they like it very much. They like the ballistics of it very much and the way that um, it carries the velocity out farther. And not only does it carry that velocity, but it has a much higher ballistic coefficient. Yes. So it's going to buck the wind better. So when you're yes. taking a, a, an aim shot under stress, you know, you're not thinking, oh, man, I got to hold for for wind. Yeah. It, it's more forgiving. Right. right. Where the five, five, six simply isn't. No, I mean, I've, I've, went, I've, I've several times everywhere. I've tried five, five, six at prey dog hunting and I'll never do it again now because it's just a waste of ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that it deserves a conversation at the highest levels of government, whether or not like we went out and spent untold millions adopting a new handgun. And handguns aren't even used in combat for the most part. And the people that are using them are special operations. They're picking whatever handgun they want. Right. The M9 didn't need to be replaced. It was it was just a dumb move. There was, it was a huge waste people. of money. There were Agreed. only certain people that got like an M9. And our our team, our little team of mine, we only had one. That was yeah. it. And that's because we were on the, the, the sniper team on the company, you know. And uh, the, the guy carrying the M24 carried the M9. You know what I mean? And then we had an M4 or whatever. But... It's not like everybody had an M9 on their hip. Right. No, it just you had your M4 rifle. Right. You know, You'll see so. officers carrying right. them, and and, You'll and see you officers, know. Uh, you know, maybe the first sergeant or Guys whatever. Guys in the rear with the gear, right? You know, right. Yeah. They'll they'll have the, the you know a, a the sidearm and whatnot. But now imagine if we had taken that money, and and spent it because the military has been trying to replace the M16 since it was adopted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes back to the 70s. Colt was experimenting with piston guns and experimenting with, with the, the AR-18 came up. Um, you know, there was a, a weapon system very few people even know anything about called the FARC-3 that came out that Eugene Stoner designed. They were they were looking at some of the deficiencies of the M16, which have long since been worked out. But um, the M16 has always been on the chopping block. But I don't I think that would have been true of any military service rifle because in the end it served 60 some years and I still think it's the best rifle on the battlefield today. I just don't think it's in the right cartridge. I think that if we went to 6 arc it's a barrel and bolt swap and a mag swap, right? So we don't have to incur a whole bunch of cost. We just got to rebarrel the weapons. That's something armors can do all across the country. We just got to change a bolt. Any grunt in the field can put a bolt in the gun because they have to field strip to clean it anyway. Just issue new magazines. Now, one reason people have, have asked, you know, well, you know, Mac, why are you against 6.5 Grindle? Well, 6.5 Grindle doesn't fit well with the AR-15. The 6.5 Grindle has a very steep taper to the case, which means it needs a more curved magazine to feed reliably. And it's just not well suited for use in the AR-15. It's better suited for weapons like the AK. Uh, the 6 Arc and the 6.8 SPC stack fine in a standard Stenag style magazine mm -hmm. with some minor modifications and you can still get 30 rounds and get reliable feeding. So that's why I'm an advocate for six arc and six, eight. I'm leaning towards six, eight, but um, yeah, I, I just, I just don't understand why NATO and the United <clears throat> States are clinging to this, this five, five, six. Is it something that I'm missing? Is it just, we don't want to spend the money. We finally got NATO in sync after 40 years of the half of NATO using 762 by 51, the other half using 556, and we just don't want to rock the boat because we already know that the U.S. Army is looking again to not only replace the M4, but to also change cartridges. We're looking at, at General Perp, or actually Sig corrected me on this one. Uh, the machine gun that Sig's working on in 68 by 51 is a light machine gun. The thing only weighs 12 pounds. Have you seen that thing? Yeah. Yeah, it looks it's huge. In, it's impressive. But it's like 12 to 14 pounds it's and it impressive. fires it. So it's a light machine gun shooting 6.8x51. And 6.8x51 isn't much different than 308. We discussed this in a recent video until you get out past 500 yards. And then that's when the ballistic coefficient of the 6.8, the superior ballistics of the 6.8, start to really shine. And so it makes sense in a light machine gun. For the general purpose machine gun, they're looking at 338, the US, US military yeah. is. And now, the 6.8 SPC was a military cartridge program that failed, and then it wound up being used by hunters in Texas and by me. You know, I've killed deer with it, and hunters mm -hmm. in Texas just love the cartridge. Um, and now we're looking at the 6 ARC, 
And the shooting public now is just starting to take a look at the six arc, but the military, at least in the special operations community, is actively using it. And the army, at least, um, if not the Navy, SEALs, uh, are looking at this new cartridge and potentially considering a switch. And if our special operations community makes that switch, it would make sense to me to eventually try to push NATO to, uh, to adopt a more potent cartridge that's good at both close and longer ranges. Because right now we have a cartridge that's really well suited for CQB and shorter engagements. You know, I wouldn't want to shoot past 300 yards with a 5.56. I can hit stuff at five, 600 yards with iron sights with a 5.56, you know, once I figure out my wind. But well, it's not ideal. As you know, with anything in the military, it's not just as simple as a barrel bolt magazine swap. They have to... <laughs> the amount of stuff that would probably need to be changed to do this caliber change or whatever it may be, because I do agree with back when they did the Barrett M468, when they were putting up, you know, a, a larger caliber while, while still maintaining the AR-15 M16, you know, style, they were on the right path. And I do believe they should have continued that. And I do believe that's where the swap probably should have started and we could have been there by now. But uh, it's interesting to me though, that all of the proposed and uh, changes in caliber and the testing that's going on among the different branches and army to their credit has always been at the forefront of just pounding the daylights out of proposed new weapon systems. But um, none of this testing was going on when we were full tilt boogie in Iraq and Afghanistan. We were issuing rifles, we were issuing ammo and we were working. You got to remember about a military budget. If you don't use it, you lose it. And when you're not in full-on wartime deployment cycle, what are you going to spend this money on so that you ensure that you get it next year? I know. Let's they go back to a Cold War fighting. Let's, de mm -hmm. let's develop a need for a new round while we're not fighting anybody. Right. Whereas for the last 20 years with OIF and OEF combined, I mean, 5.56, five, 308 have been the two go-tos for everything, for everybody. And I really think that you cannot have the AR M16 platform. I mean, you can, but prolifically stoners design in the five, five, six. I think that's the tractor pull in the trailer. I think that the modularity ease of use and interchangeability of parts in those rifles makes them perfect to just hand to the next person at the armory, go do your job. And then we leave the specialized calibers to things like our seal friends or, you know, the forward operating units and all of the branches. I mean, they have their whole own budget with which, like you say, they can do whatever they want. They can make whatever whatever weapons choices they want. If if forward operating units are using something like six arc, that doesn't. I don't think that necessarily negates the budget to change everybody <clears throat> who will not be operating in that capacity to the same caliber, because mo you know ninety five ninety percent of the troops are not going to be doing CQB night operations. You know what I mean. The support troops, the general line troops, I think they have a, a significantly different need that doesn't, I don't think that the military wants to spend the budget on changing all of them over as well. So two questions. Do you think that the 556 will stay in U.S. military service as its primary infantry cartridge for as long as we have the M16? Because really, even though they're constantly looking at new weapon systems, yeah. uh, they'll get halfway through the the testing cycle and they'll say, yeah, it's no better than what we got. It's the, the SCAR program, the XM8 program, I could go down the whole list of all the weapon systems that they've evaluated and said, ah, it doesn't do anything the M4 doesn't do. And so we just keep doing it. So do we, is 5.56 really the future given it's, it's in my opinion, shortcomings? Or do we, do we start to look at it? So Spec Ops is using things like 6.8, or, or I'm sorry, 6ARC. Uh, what if we take a, a smaller elite unit like the Marine Corps? Because there, there were units within the Marine Corps that they issued suppressors to all of them. Yeah. So every 0311 had, had a suppressor on their weapon yeah. just to see if it made sense to be used in combat. I don't know what the outcome of that test was, but they were doing it. The Marines compared to the Army are a smaller unit. Historically, they were underfunded, but that seems to be changing because Marines are getting their own gear now and stuff like that. They still get a lot of hand-me-downs from the Army, but um, wouldn't it make sense perhaps? Because they're forward deployed, they're usually the first ones on scene someplace because they're stationed off offshore, typically, you know, with a float somewhere. Um, would it make sense to upgrade their weapon systems and and try six arc and in that capacity and see if it would make sense for big army? 
I don't think so. I think as long as we have an M16 as the American service rifle, the U.S. service rifle, I think it's going to be we're going to be using 556 in it. I mean, when we changed from the M9 to the P320, which, like you, I think was not a good move. I think the M9 was a, a superior pistol. A lot of armorers and a lot of gunsmiths in the, in the military lost their job because now that's a. I mean, a, a Sig P320 for the in, in the bulk that the military buys them is about half of the production cost as a Beretta M9. So now, if a troop comes back to the armory and says this is no good, out the window here's a fresh one. We don't have to field an armorer for that. Some units will, but I know a lot of you know gunners mates that no longer were needed because they were not servicing M9's pistols, M9 pistols. So I don't see any of the branches spending the money to recartridge without doing the whole package and coming up with a new uh, firearm platform for it. I mean, yeah. I, I just think that Stoner's design and the AR platform, it was around the 556 and we invested so heavily in it between us and NATO in the cartridges as a weapon to just hand anybody and teach them how to use it with relative ease. I don't think you would have the 556 without the AR. I don't think you'd have the AR without the 556. I think it's a package deal. Yeah. And it takes a lot of boxes I'm agree for with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a pleasant rifle to shoot. Very, you know, it, It's effective uh, given its constraints, but I also agree that it seems like the Army spends an awful lot of time and money trying to develop a new weapon system. We're going through the whole process right now with the SPEAR program, right? Um, SIG has the 68 by 51 um, We've seen video of it being fired. I don't know. I, I don't think, I hope that weapon isn't in, intended for big army or even the Marines as a, you know, a 0311 type weapon system or 11 Bravo weapon system. I hope that's not what the intent is because that's going back in time, looking at the recoil of that thing it, of the yes. video that I've seen. Um, it's going to be right back to semi-automatic only. It's just, it's just too powerful. Now, special operations makes a lot of sense, right? Um, the spear seems to be a little bit more controllable, which is heavily based on the MCX and is probably the next generation of the MCX that we'll probably see come out of SIG uh, for the civilian market. Um, they came out with this thing called the Raptor, which had like an eight inch barrel that fires the 6.8x51, which is the, uh, the spear shortened. And presumably the 6.8x51 uh, operates well out of shorter barrels, but the cartridge operates at 80,000 PSI. The 556 five, operates at 65,000, just to give you a comparison. Jeez. That's special ammo. I mean, it's got like a steel, like three or four part ammunition. Bubba, Gotta be expensive. Bubba's hot loads. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so it has a steel head, a lock ring, and a brass case. Okay. And that's just to keep it from blowing the head out at that operating pressure. Yeah. But yeah. even at that operating pressure, it's shooting a 140 grain bullet at 3,000 feet per second. My 65 PRC will do the same thing and I, at, at lower pressures with a brass case. Um, so I don't know where that's all going, but the army is doing it again, but they've done it in the past. I mean, the M468, the XM8, you know, so maybe, army's got maybe a big budget to is. maintain though. Maybe that's what this is. Maybe, you know, I'm pretty sure Pat's probably onto something here. Or, or, so you got the six arc or the six eight or the whatever, right? They have basically reserved that to the special operations type community, right? It's a smaller community. They can pick and choose what they want. Big Army will probably, just like you say, be stuck with the 5.56 and the M4 because, let's face it, the M16, the AR-15, is, it's the best, hands down. Like, there is really no reason to try to reinvent the wheel. Now, I'll argue with this, right, but just because I like to see, you know, changes happen. I like to see, you know, I think the MCX potentially might be the, the winner Changing over the M4, broken, but... Yeah. I think Big Army and, and, you know, everything is going to stick with the 5.56 just because of the fact that all the logistics are there, the packaging, the manuals, the, you know, the training, the classes. The but it's got to change at some point. But, but the other thing is, too, is if you got the special operations community going out there doing their thing with the, you know, more potent calibers with smaller amounts of men, you know, out there doing the job. And you've got Big Army with thousands of soldiers standing on whatever line it may be sending five five six down range maybe they're still on that mindset of bullet hose well, you know what i mean well but see here, here here's my thing so i always want my military to have the advantage over the enemy watching the war in ukraine it's it's horrible what, what's happening over there is absolutely horrible war crimes out the wazoo all sorts of stuff so when i say that what i find to be comical about it is the russians and their complete inability to fight wars 
all the video I've seen, the pictures I've seen, they're using primarily AK-74Ms chambered in 545 by 39, and they're running iron sights. They won't fight at night. They dig in at night and they start their assaults early in the morning. Any NATO country armed with any weapon system that we fought the war on terror with, where we had ACOGs and red dot sites and uh, PECs and, night and NODs, Russia doesn't stand a chance if that's how they fight still. They're stuck in 1950s technology. They don't stand a chance against NATO. I want NATO and our allies to have even a bigger leg up because if you look at the 545 and the 556, they're pretty neck and neck because the 545 was a, a reaction to R556 that the Russians discovered our use in Vietnam and they wanted something comparable, right? A small, fast bullet. And so I want to blaze the trail again. I, I want to set us up a, to, to be better equipped than our enemies. And if that's the six arc that extends that range, because if they're sh you're shooting iron sights and 545s, I want to be shooting six arc and ACOGs. Mm -hmm. I want to be shooting six arc and thermals. I want our military not to be equal, but vastly superior. And I don't think 556 five, gets us there anymore. I no. just don't. I do believe that if we could actually get mainline to change the caliber to something more potent that's not that much heavier, because six arc is what, 108 grain. And then, um, you know, there's a little bit more brass, a little bit more powder, but not terribly much. It still fits in the R15 M16. And then 6.8 SPCs, roughly 115, 120 grain or so. Same 110, thing, a little you bit can of get brass, 110, so it's about the same. But yeah. it's not terrible, right? When you load up like a 25 round mag of 308, you can feel the heft to it. I mean, right. it's got some heft. Whereas like a 30 round of 6.8 is not too oh. bad. I mean, mm -hmm. in all honesty. Mm -hmm. So I do, I, I want to... I would like to see a, a caliber change for sure. And they can still maintain the M4 because honestly, it's a great rifle. Yeah. And, the fact and it works well with the six arc. The caliber, yep. It works well with the six arc. The recoil is not that bad. It's not that horribly uncontrollable. And I honestly, I would love to test it on full auto. As a matter of fact, maybe one day we can, you know, get a full auto lower and actually see the controllability of, right. you know, the uh, 6.8 or the six arc. But I just believe that our government being the government, most certainly doesn't want to spend the money. Well, I, I think that they, they want to spend the money, but I think that people are still married to the M16. And I get that. I love the rifle. I mean, of, of all the weapons that I've encountered in my life, I, I, I love all military firearms, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I played with the AK there for a short while and we started getting Russian AKs. I thought, oh, this is going to be cool. And I quickly realized this is World War II technology. This is, you know, stampings and shoddy construction and no two rifles are the same. And I moved back over towards the AR-15. I've been playing with the SIG Virtus now for the last couple of years. I really think that's uh, a really interesting new weapon system. That in six arc. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the only problem with the civilian side of things is the civilians, we benefit from the U.S. Army's use of the 556, right? Because we produce it by the millions of rounds a day, right? So whatever's not going to the Army, is going straight to the to the gun shore shells. Well, who, and it's cheap, affordable everywhere. Who's the alpha in that symbiotic relationship, though, between the civilian market and the military market? Because while the military does spend, I'm sure, millions a year on weapons platform testing and ammunition testing or procurement, it's got a pale in comparison to how many Americans own an AR platform. Mm -hmm. Like billions of dollars spent every year on this platform it's 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 the military's expenditure on that as much as they spend is going to be minimal compared to the American market or the North American market or anywhere else where the AR-15 is the every person rifle. And I have to say that in a world where the military orders their tools to a very specific specification or set of or set thereof, the American market is wide open. We can have our AR-15s with forward assists. We can have them without forward assists. We can have them in this caliber, that caliber, nine mil. The platform can be adapted. Stoner's original design can always be adapted to any number of things. As such, that, I think, combined with the ease of use, the modularity, and the ease of maintenance, I think that the private market is really, really driving the proliferation of the platform and the 5.56 caliber. There's a lot of homes in this county, let alone this country, that have at least one AR-15 chambered in 5.56 in there. Yeah. Now, going back to what you were saying about Russia invading in Ukraine, their every person rifle is an AK. Most of them, I would presume, chambered in 7.62 by 39. Because five, four, that's five. 
the the Ukrainians as well. Man, they've I've played. seen a lot of five four fives. They that have whole thing is on five four five back and forth. They're using both. Yeah. Okay. So I, I've seen they have their own domestically produced bullpup, the Vulcan, uh, that's based on the AK. I think it's seven six two by thirty nine. But a lot of the rifles I see being handed out are like old school uh, AK seventy fours, like with uh, laminated wood stocks and stuff. We see okay. some plum furniture. And and stuff maybe like mix that. Both, it's a mix. I'm telling you what, if if anything like that were to, God forbid, ever happen here in any kind of capacity, it would not take long before the average citizen who is a, a rifle user, an AR-15 user, to be able to tell which house on the block has AR-15 mags in it and which one doesn't. You just know that some somebody within a quarter mile of me has got 5.56 loaded into a Stenag mag that maybe they can, I can trade for it, I can barter for it, here's a loaf of bread, I need some ammunition. Whatever, I mean, you can what if it to death, but the fact remains that the 5.56 mated to the AR-15 platform is the American rifle. Oh, absolutely. The every person rifle. And, and that'd be the slowest to change, right? Yes. This change so, wouldn't happen in but the day the that demand, we're the, the military the can do whatever wants. The, the American public, I think, is more enticing to manufacturers to keep producing that and convince the military to take, well, stay on this platform, we'll just develop you a new round. Because to retool the whole thing, now they're at cost for retooling all their manufacturing lines for ammunition. You now have a whole new design of firearm to launch this thing. That's a lot of money and a lot of good faith on the part of the manufacturers just based on the military contract alone. Look what happened to Colt. So, Colt put all their money into the military contract basket yeah. and pretty much shunned the American public and they didn't survive that. I think that it's not the military driving the popularity of the round anymore. I think it's the availability of everyday mm. users around the world. I agree with that to a certain point, but Americans want what um, the military uses, what law enforcement uses, case in point. I was into nine millimeters before 10 millimeter came along. This event, in history called the Dade County shootout took place in 1986. Yep. And the FBI took a look at the <laughs> after action reports and decided that the nine millimeter was insufficient, wasn't lethal enough. It wound up being the silver tip was the problem. Hmm. Nine millimeters, plenty lethal. It's killed yeah. more people globally than any other handgun cartridge. But they went from the nine millimeter, had an e jerk reaction, short history lesson. There are two factions within the FBI. We immediately got to get rid of nine millimeters. We need to go to 45 ACP. Another one's like, no, man, have you seen my uh, this 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 new television show with, with this guy named Crockett that has this Bren 10? We got to go this 10 millimeter, man. That's like 357 Magnum and a handgun. And so there was this infighting and the FBI decided to go with the 10 millimeter. And the 10 millimeter, to your point, and I believe you made this point as well, the 10 millimeter, when it was issued to FBI troops, their qualification scores plummeted because they were shooting the Norma rounds, which was a 200 grain bullet, stepping it out at like 1300 plus feet per second. Yeah. It, it's it's a powerful cartridge and a lot of recoil and their their qualification scores went down. So they came up with the FBI load, which was a PUD loaded 10 millimeter, which Smith and Wesson then said, well, you know what? We can shave an eighth of an inch off the case, make it a little bit shorter. It'll fit in a standard nine millimeter handgun. It'll hold one or two less rounds, but hey, we'll call it the 40 Smith and Wesson. Yeah. And they pitched that to the FBI. They adopted it. And what happened? Within a decade, every police department had 40 Smith and Wesson and Americans started buying it up like crazy, Right. All, all because the FBI went looking for a new cartridge. Now, what do you think would happen to the American public if they decided the big army went to 6 Arc? Everybody would start upgrading their rifles to 6 Arc as fast as they could, especially as the ammunition became more available and more affordable. The biggest hurdle right now is lack of availability and cost. But if big army adopted it, that means federal and Remington, which is owned by federal and all these big manufacturers wanted would start cranking out rounds by the millions and whatever the military didn't use would wind up on the shelves of local gun stores. So it, it could be, it would likely be if the military shifts gears and goes to another cartridge and or rifle, there's going to be a new Americans, America's rifle in the future. And there will be a new America's cartridge in the future. Mm -hmm. Five, five, six ain't going to last forever. That's what I believe. My point is, I think that change needs to start happening now. Yeah, I believe it too. I don't. I don't see five, five, six lasting another ten years. But, really? but it, it, it will not does. go. It will not go anywhere while the United States Service Rifle is the M sixteen. I just don't. I agree see, with I, that. I don't see it happening. No, as long while as while we're as, shouldering M yeah. sixteens, we're on that five, five, six wheel and try and make it rounder. I don't think anybody can. They've I tried. agree with that. 
Yep. I, as long as the U.S. military sticks with 5.56, the U.S. public's going to stick with 5.56. Yes. But I do think there will be a change. That The military has been trying for 60 years to replace the M16 and find another cartridge. And eventually they're going to do it. It's just, what is it going to be? Not this decade, baby. Right. I'll probably be <laughs> dust by the time <laughs> they figure it out. Not this decade, baby. So, um, you know, on the civilian side of things, you know, 223 makes an awful lot of sense, right? It's affordable. It's everywhere. You know, people have stockpiled it. It, it would take a long time for people to move away from that to another cartridge down the road, uh, probably not in my lifetime. I just but, think it's a utilitarian cartridge. I mean, you know, the old saying, jack of all trades, master of none. The 5.56 five, out of a out of an AR style platform ticks a lot of boxes. I mean- Only out of a 20 inch barrel. These short barreled 5.56s five, five, are a joke. Even, I mean, Jason Jacob and I went and took a class at North Porter County and it was a handgun class, but they always make a point once all of the curriculum is done and everybody who has, has shown up and signed up for the class, they always say, would anybody like to try an AR-15? Because they know that the AR-15 has been bastardized as a redheaded stepchild and an evil thing that sits in the corner. It's a, it's a weapon of war. Because of the media. Because of the media, right. So to their credit, the instructors will always ask at the end of the course, would anybody like to try this big scary rifle? And the line is always stacked. And you know who's always mostly in that line is new women shooters. Mm -hmm. And to see that aha moment on, a, on any new shooter, male or women, child, to see that aha moment when they grab an AR-15 and they crack off a magazine, it's just ear to ear grin because it's so easy. Charge, safety, aim. It's, it's, six, it's easy to six get- Six arc wouldn't change any of that. The right. recoil's not even that much more. I, you, they, I, I would challenge you, if we put a blindfold on, I put an M855A1 cartridge in a rifle and use the exact same rifle except set it for six arc, I would challenge you to say, that's definitely the six arc I just fired. It is really not that much more recoil. And I believe you. I just think that it started the race too late. I but mean, it's fine. We change. need to begin. That's 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 right. the whole point of this. Is I don't. Need to I begin. don't necessarily think we do. Jason. We need to start. I'm perfectly happy we need with to start five, five, six. steering <laughs> this ship. But I'm not. <laughs> Have you been to his house? I'm not a sharpshooter either. Have you been to his house and seen? He has a brown bess on the wall. He still thinks most, <laughs> most loading unrifled <laughs> barrels on the way forward. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, no, I, I get it. I get it. No, I get it. But so, I would have. I would have killed to have six arc or six point eight SPC in Iraq. I would have. Mm. What a great, great round that would have been. Literally would have killed yes, to have it. I would have, I would have killed to have it, literally. Um, just because, just because of that energy, the barrier penetration, the, the distance, the everything. It would have been great. You know, as a matter of fact, I was that guy and I got a picture of it that outfitted an M14 with an EOTech on it. I've seen that picture. Sake, so. You're all saying they're all smiles. <laughs> I'm like, how did you even just get that because, on there? Just because, yeah, I mean, I, I popped an EOTech on the rail there and I taped the light to the side of it because we didn't have all the cool guy stuff that everybody has now, right? We were, I like to think of in 2005, we were still pioneering stuff, you know. But uh, yeah, I wanted more power, more distance, more everything. But Evolver I'm not your man. average I guess you could say I wasn't the average soldier. I was. I had shot ever since I had grown up. I loved shooting. I always, but I knew a thing or two about ballistics. I knew how to shoot a firearm. You know what I mean? So, right. well, but your average soldier knows nothing of that, nor do they even care about less that. They're and just less like, with each I passing out generation. Three years and three. You know what I mean? So, but. so, Army infantry, mm -hmm. Marine infantry, Pogue. Oh, Con stop. Construction worker. So CVs as some, are badass. Right, right. In their own right. But we are our, our primary goal, our primary mission is not to fight. We build first, then we fight. But you're forward so in dangerous areas. Yes, yes. But in lieu of that, in lieu of our mission statement, we do not get the training that you two respectively would have gotten to go into an environment. So as such, I'm not trained enough to notice the difference in what I can exploit out of a 5.56 versus what I can exploit out of a six arc. I can tell you the, the bucket capacity of that excavator over there <laughs> because that's that's my job to know. Right. I, what I know how there. to use the weapon. I know how to use it safely, efficiently, and I know how to organize with other people using that weapon. The 5.56 and the AR-15 is a force multiplier. You hand one fighter that's semi-decent and knows how to safely make this thing work, you hand them one AR-15, and three magazines, that's now a fire team element of firepower if they are choosy with their shots. So it's very for, easy for somebody like me 
who is a construction worker adapted to fighting instead of a fighter adapted to fighting better, it's a very easy for me to walk up to something like an AR-15 and go, yeah, this makes sense, 30 rounds in here. Yes, we could change it to something like six arc without changing much. But based upon Stoner's original design, the investment we have all made in feeding these guns and then the proliferation of handing them out to various people to use. I'm telling you, as a, as a salesperson now, selling these rifles, if you were to come in and say, look, I'm a new shooter. I've just decided that I need a rifle in my home. My wife and I moved out into the country. What's my best, easiest option that's not going to bend me over a barrel on cost? Yeah. The 5.56 ammo is still one of the cheaper rifle ammos to, ammos to shoot. The guns you can get into a rely. I mean, you can get into a Smith and Wesson M and P fifteen for between five fifty and seven fifty, depending on how it comes to you outfitted. It really is a package deal for anybody who is not a trained warfighter. For anybody who has not given the thought to how can I maximize the exploitation of a five five six round all the way out to five hundred yards, seven hundred yards, which they will do. Will they kill somebody that far? That remains to be seen, but the average shooter who's wanting this rifle for the protection of their home, for the protection of their, you know, new fob in Afghanistan, it makes sense to me because it ticks the most boxes. The ammo's light, it's cheap, it's readily available, it fits in all of these magazines, and I know how to make it work. Beyond that, I really don't give much consideration. I'm very utilitarian in it because yeah. I want to be able to hand this to anybody and let them have that aha moment and make this thing work effectively. It's it's yeah. not the I, best I, round. I, I won't argue it's... the point that that you know on the civilian side, gun store sales, five five six is going nowhere anytime soon. I get soon. what he's saying though. In his particular job in the military, like he said, you know, it, it, he could tell you the exact amount that that bucket could hold. The rifle to him in that aspect is just a rifle. If he was attacked, he's to grab the rifle, aim and shoot doesn't matter the caliber. He's not looking right. at it as a caliber. He's looking at it as a, this is my defensive weapon that I was given. Whereas you and I we'll go out in to infantry the... <laughs> would be like, yeah, this needs to be more powerful because, right. you know, it, it kills better or whatever. But that was our, our job, right? We're the fighting force, if you will. So we might look at it like we Which... want more power. And he looks at it like this is more than enough. I'm digging this hole over here, you know, oh, right. I'm being attacked. I yeah. point my rifle, I shoot. Right. So mm -hmm. we've got like 300 meters and we're out there shooting iron sights and we're goofing around on, you know, between filming. Right. And, and we're sitting there with iron sights and we'll just take a look at the wind. Like, yeah, that's about 10, 11 mile an hour wind coming out of the Southwest. And it's like, all right, just going to hold right over that shoulder. And we're using iron sights and ding. Yeah. It's because we've been able to do that for decades. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's not a skill that is like natural. It, it's it's a tr it's a taught skill and it's a skill that comes with experience and constant practice. It's and it's one of those skills that is also uh, a perishable skill that if you don't keep doing it, absolutely. you will lose the capability of oh, doing absolutely. that. Absolutely. And I, I used to say, uh, you know, people would say, oh, you know, how accurate are you with the rifle? And I would just jokingly say, based upon the area where we live, I don't live in a desert where I can see for two miles. If I can see, I can hit you. And and that is my view of the rifle. If I can see a threat, I want to be able to hit it. And there can be a threat at 500 yards. If you get five guys during, you know, Shiznit hits the fan and they decide to go marauding and they're just going from house to house and you hear, them, you hear about them coming and you see this band of marauders coming across the cornfield, coming for your house, you know, and they're all carrying weapons openly. I'd love to smoke them with six art. Or <laughs> I, tell you I that. mean, so there, there but... may be instances where you need to take that shot. Mm -hmm. And I... I would be using a 308 or a 68 or a 6 arc. The same goes so pad even in the job that you had though you wouldn't have known at the time potentially the difference if you had a 6 arc in there or a 556. You right? never would have known the you difference. You would have been right? handed the rifle, you'd have said no, they're attacking me, I'm going to shoot them. The caliber change has nothing to do, I guess you could say with the soldier's knowledge of wanting to you know kill, defend or whatever it is. It's literally we're amplifying the power of the current service rifle if you will and giving greater distance and knockdown power. Because unfortunately, you know, there are some instances where whoever you're, you know, shooting at is really high on adrenaline, really high on drugs, really high on what? And it's almost like they're a Superman or Superwoman or something, and they just don't go down. And it, they need that massive amount of, you know, tissue damage or shock or whatever it may be 
to put that person down, you know, quickly because that threat can take out quite a few of your friends potentially while you're trying to take them down with 556. Five, Where if you had maybe six arc or 6.8, they yeah. knocked them down in one hit. But here's well, to hoping for the future or whatnot that we can get rid of 556. Five, I and would move, like and to move towards something a little bit. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you're crazy. Well, I, I appreciate you guys chiming in. Yeah. And, and thanks you for know, having me. Yeah, I think it's great having an opposing viewpoint. Jason and I, you know, spent a lot of time together. We spent a lot of time with, you know, on rifles together when we're out filming and shooting. Oh, yeah. I mean, three, four days a week, we're, we're on guns, right? And so we have these conversations, and that's why we wanted to have this public conversation, because sure. we've we've been mulling this over. We've, we've played with all these cartridges, and we're like, why is the military still using this varmint cartridge? There's so much better out there. When do we start this conversation? When does the military finally get off the X and start to decide, okay, we got to upgrade because we need a more versatile cartridge that's good in jungle fighting, that's good in the wide open spaces of Af Afghanistan and, and you know, all that other stuff. So um, what do you think it would take to get them to come off it and change? What do you think would have to happen? A something political a scope in the that I'm unaware of. War? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all politics at this yeah, point. It's, it's budgets point. and politics stuff way above my pay grade. Mm. I, I think the the average soldier would probably tell you if you sat down, had this conversation with them, they would probably say, yeah, I'd like to try six arc. An 11 Bravo or an 0311, right? right? They, they, they would they would they would look at it and like, really, I, I, I can make a shot at 350, 400 yards and and uh, not really have to worry too much about wind. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. You know, I can punch through a barrier more readily. Okay. You know, so I, I think that um, it, it's just, it's, I don't know what's going to prompt it. I mean, the military's constantly spending money trying to find a new weapon system and new cartridge. It's going to come when they change. It'll happen weapon. someday. That's the only time anyway. it, it'll be. Yep. It's going to change when they change weapon. I think the future of the weapon is going to be modular. Has to be. SIG is on to something with the spear, but um, that's the an caliber impressive. is wrong. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I think that's where that change will take place is when they change the weapon. Now, whenever that is, we don't know. We don't know. I hope the spear is multi-caliber because I think the spear would make an outstanding military right. rifle based upon my knowledge of the MCX. Right. All right, guys, I really appreciate you watching this video. We look forward to the comments down below. If you agree with us or if you disagree with us, we want to read those comments. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best possible way to do that is to become part of our Patreon family. There is a link in the video description below. You'll get early access to videos like this one. You'll have direct access to me. I answer all private communications. Again, that link is in the video description below. And also right here on YouTube, a little join button underneath the video player you're watching right now, mash that join button and you can support us here on YouTube in the age of demonetization. And last but not least, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 14 years of support and uh, don't beat up too bad on us in the, uh, in the comment section. <laughs> we'll talk to you guys soon.